Good day, Crime Talk aficionados. My name is Scott Reich, and this is Crime Talk. We have a busy docket today, so let's open the record. First, another continuance in the Lori Vallow, Chad Day Bell matter. Wait till you hear the reason for this one. Second, hashtag free Jussie. That's right, it's a real thing. Now, Alec Baldwin, is he just cold and heartless, or was this some of the best lawyering you've seen in a long time? Fourth, there is a serial killer out there targeting homeless people. Sherry Papini, everything's all fun and games until you get caught. Now, there's a suspect uh, in the Museum of Modern Art uh, stabbing cases, and he is literally taunting the authorities on social media. And the new flavor of the month when it comes to crime, yeah, we've had catalytic converters being stolen. Uh, we've had uh, scrap metal. Now it's gas. That's right, stealing of gas. And then finally, our dumb criminal of the day gives new definition to the word felony stupid. Let's talk about it. Good day, Crime Talk aficionados. It's Monday, March 14th, 2022. You know the drill. If you haven't done so already, please hit that subscribe button. Hit that little bell over in the corner so that you receive notifications of when we go live or put up new content. And quick reminder, we will go live tomorrow, 6 p.m. Mountain Time, right here, right here, 6 p.m. We'll be here for an hour, and then we'll do our Patreon show as well. So if you're not a Patreon member, it behooves you to join and become a Patreon member so that you can partake in the extra bonus material that you won't get at any other time. And as I've mentioned this before, you can listen to us anytime you want by simply downloading Crime Talk with Scott Reich on any of your favorite podcasting apps. All right, before we start on today's docket, let's take a moment to give thank you to our sponsor, CrimeTalkPrep.com. Okay, we talked about this the other day, and I've been saying this for a while now. You never know when the unexpected is going to happen, so you have to be prepared. I mean, who would have thought over two years ago when somebody said there would be a pandemic and the entire economy would shut down? You would have laughed. I would have laughed. If somebody had said, oh, there's going to be a war in the Ukraine and they could be threatening the use of nuclear weapons three weeks ago, I would have laughed. Well, guess what? And I read an article today. The uh, head of the UN basically said that nuclear war is a threat. Now, you may say, what do I need to be prepared for if there's a nuclear war? Well, hopefully, God forbid, it doesn't happen. But if it does, you need to be prepared. Okay, go to crimetalkprep.com. And it doesn't need to be for nuclear war. It could be for a flood, a snowstorm, any type of emergency where you need to be prepared for your family. When I mean, you go to crimetalkprep.com, you're going to be able to get $50 off your order. And if you go there right now, you can get $50 off a three-month supply. Now, you don't have to order three months. You can order as much or as little as you want. But the point is, you got to be prepared. At the end of the day, nobody, no help is coming. You need to be prepared to take care of yourself. So go to crimetalkprep.com so that you can be prepared. All right, let's open the record for March 14th, 2022. Lori Vallow, Chad Daybell, yet another continuance. I have never seen a case where a motions deadline has not been set and a motions date to hear all the motions has not been set. I've never seen such piecemeal motions practice anywhere. Well, it gets better. As you may recall, the change of venue was granted in the Lori Vallow, Chad Day Bell case. Basically, uh, the court determined that they were not going to be able to get a fair trial in Madison and Fremont uh, counties. It just wasn't going to be possible. And then the prosecutor said, hey, it's going to be really expensive for us to move the trial to the other side of the state. Uh, to, And there's going to be great costs associated with the prosecution, witnesses, uh, family, as well as uh, sheriff personnel having to keep those individuals uh, obviously housed and to get them to court. It was going to be a huge expense. That's the only thing that matters at the end of the day when it comes kind of to the prosecution. Justice is expensive. 
I get it. Uh, but then they always say it's so, so expensive and they don't have to pay for it when you know justice requires it. So I think the judge made the right decision moving uh, the case over to Ada County, which is on the western side there of Idaho. And the prosecution then filed a motion to reconsider saying, hey, judge, look at the numbers that we have put together and it's going to be astronomical. It's going to cost hundreds of thousands of dollars to hold this trial. So please reconsider. And the proposed solution for the prosecution was, hey, let's pick a jury up there in Ada County. And instead of relocating everybody down in Fremont and Madison counties up to Ada County, we'll just bring the jury down. We'll put them in a hotel. They'll be focused and we won't have all the expense and inconvenience of moving us, just inconvenience the jury. And they came up with all of these lists and this spreadsheet and said it's going to cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. Well, the prosecution has filed a motion captioned, motion for continuance of the state's motion to reconsider transport or transfer of venue to Ada County. Now, what is the basis for that? Well, apparently the state puts in their motion that the state learned that personnel from the Ada County court system and representatives from the 7th Judicial District um, had a meeting on March 1st regarding the venue and uh, trials in the uh, Daybell cases. Further, the state learned some of the information discussed during those meetings may differ from information previously supplied to the state's witnesses. The state is attempting to ascertain the extent to which the information from March 1st, 2022, Ada County meeting differs from the information previously obtained by the state. The state discloses to the defense counsel was based on the original information obtained by the state's witnesses. Should this information stemming from the March 1st meeting uh, differ, uh, they will notify everybody. But therefore, out of abundance of caution, the state respectfully requests that the hearing on the state's motion to reconsider uh, transport of jurors be continued to a date to both parties to allow the state time to learn and disclose to the defendants any additional or conflicting information. Well, that motion basically says, how do you say we got it wrong without saying we got it wrong? Well, that's how you do it. That's lawyer speak for, for that. Well, we're not sure. The information's changing. Uh, we're going to need a little more time. Okay, now it could come in lower or it could come in higher. My guess is it's probably going to be a little less expensive given the information provided in this motion, but we'll never know because we weren't at that March 1st meeting and the state is not saying exactly what was uh, the difference just yet. But needless to say, another continuance requested and I'm sure another continuance granted. The Lori Vallow, Chad DeBell cases is a case where literally nothing ever gets done. Let's go, Idaho. Let's speed it up. Let's speed it up. Just saying. Slow. Next on the docket. That's right. Hashtag free Jesse Smollett. Well, that's right. That's what people are claiming. Jesse Smollett's brother took to the actor's Instagram account to announce that Jesse has been deemed at risk of self-harm and he's been moved to the Cook County Jail's psych ward. Now, his brother says at the beginning of this video, what's very concerning is that there was a note attached to his paperwork today and clipped on the front of his jail cell saying that he's at risk for self-harm. I'm not trying to throw stones here, but I would think that if any note was on the front of his cell, we'd probably want to confirm who wrote it. Just saying. That's right, because when people are convicted of lying, they usually are not taken at their word. Anyway, his Jesse Smollett's brother repeats that Jesse insists that he is not at risk of harm and that he is very stable, strong, and healthy. Now, Mr. Smollett, as you may recall, was sentenced last Thursday to five months in the county jail. And then when he gets out, he will have to serve two and a half years on felony probation for fabricating an alleged hate crime against him back in 2019. Now, Mr. Smollett has insisted on his innocence. And at his sentencing hearing, he made a showing of pronouncing himself not suicidal. I did not do this. I am not suicidal. And if anything happens to me where I go in there, 
I did not do it to myself, and you must all know that. He declared that while being taken out of the courtroom. I guess that he was worried that he was somehow going to be suicided, just like that guy named Jeff in New York. But so far, Jesse Smollett is still here with us. Now, on Instagram, uh, Jesse Smollett's uh, brother said that uh, his brother was convicted and jailed without any concrete evidence. He further states, I want you all to Google right now the long list of wrongful convictions in the United States. There were 150 exonerations in 2018 alone, a.k.a. the government realizing they wrongfully convicted someone. Y'all blindly believe in our criminal justice system so much that you think a guilty verdict means a crime was committed. There's absolutely no evidence leaking Jesse to staging his own hate crime besides the testimony of two brothers that he said he said not litigation. Yeah, yeah, that's what he said. I'm just reading the quote. Uh, But there was testimony. We had the uh, videos. We had the brothers who came and testified that Jesse Smollett paid them to beat him up in this hate crime. Uh, And it was all fake. And a jury, a very diverse jury. This was not some all-white jury in Chicago. It was a very diverse jury that convicted Jesse Smollett. And as the judge said at his sentencing, his testimony was nothing but perjury. So I get that his family is standing behind him and they should continue to stand behind him because that is important for people when they are going through the process to be rehabilitated, to have a strong support system. But the jury has found him guilty, okay? And in my humble opinion, the defense that was presented from what I saw was not very good at all. And they kind of knew that things were not going well, particularly when they were holding their head down when their client was speaking at his own sentencing. Not going well. Um, And when the judge basically says that your client perjured himself when he got up there and testified, that's not going well for him. I think he also called him a charlatan, if I'm correctly Uh, recalling that, which I think I am. Anyway, so the brother said, um, are you not terrified the precedent that this sets? This means you could hang out with some folks, one of them being your friend, and then all it takes is two individuals saying you did something um, and now you're convicted. Guilty of a crime. Wild. Uh, The brother also went on to promote the hashtag free Jussie on the post and called out a number of notable public figures, including Angela Davis, Danny Glover, Linda Sassour uh, for supporting Jesse years ago and uh, but being silent uh, regarding his conviction. He should include people like Michelle Obama, District Attorney Kim Fox, and the current Vice President Kamala Harris, who said that this was a modern day lynching. Or was that President Biden? I don't really recall which one it was, but one of them did. And where are they now? Just saying. You find out who your friends are, Jesse, when you go to jail and when you get charged as well. Now, Jesse Smollett's actress sister, Journey Smollett, also expressed her support for, quote, black Americans are incarcerated in state prison at nearly five times the rate of white Americans. Jesse is innocent and you don't have to believe in his innocence to believe that he should be free. She included the hashtags free Jesse and stop locking up our people. Hashtag. So I get it. I've lost trials, okay? It sucks when your client goes to jail, even if it's not for a very long time. Jesse Smollett is not going to trial for exercising his constitutional rights. Jesse Smollett was being punished because of the crime that he was found guilty of by a jury. He can certainly appeal his conviction, and if the judge made an error that resulted in an unfair trial, then Mr. Smollett would be entitled to a new trial. But the way the process works is you have to do the appeal and you get to go to jail now and start that sentence. It may not seem fair, but you have to have some finality in the criminal court system to move forward. Jesse Smollett, like I said, didn't get punished for going to trial. He probably got punished a little bit for lying on the witness stand at trial. And he got punished for wasting resources of the police department chasing down false leads in a completely fabricated wild goose chase. That's what he got arrested for. 
That's what he was convicted for, and that's why he went to jail, not because he's black. Next on the docket, Alec Baldwin, okay? This is either some of the coldest and most heartless thing I've heard of or some of the best lawyering I've seen in a while, okay? So now Alec Baldwin is saying that his rust contract makes him judgment-proof in the fatal shooting of Helena Hutchins. And Baldwin's lawyers filed an arbitration claim alleging his deal shields him from any financial responsibility in connection with Hutchinson's death. His lawyer, his lawyer also adds that Baldwin's legal fees should be covered by the production company as well. But it even gets more interesting. In the documents, Baldwin says that Helena Hutchins is the one who told him how to position the firearm. She allegedly told him to position the gun higher so that it would be pointed directly at her. The lawyer goes on in the filings saying, quote, in giving and following these instructions, Hutchins and Baldwin shared a core vital belief that the gun was cold and contained no live rounds. The attorney also says that Baldwin asked Hutchins if she wanted him to pull back the hammer. Baldwin says that Hutchins told him, yes, pull back the hammer. The pleadings further states also that interactions that Baldwin's had with Hutchins' husband, Matthew, after the fatal shooting. It's alleged that Hutchins apparently hugged Baldwin and said, I guess we're going to get through this together, end quote. Of course, we know this relationship did not last long after Baldwin sat down for an interview and absolved himself of any responsibility of the shooting. Now, the documents also say that it's not the actor's job to check the gun for live ammo, that it's the armorer's job to do that, and obviously the armorer failed. Now, Baldwin held the title executive producer of the movie Rust, but his lawyers say that his contract uh, has an indemnity clause, and therefore the production company has to indemnify or pay any judgment that would be uh, imposed against him. Now, currently there are no criminal charges against Baldwin, and like everybody here, they are given the presumption of innocence unless and until they are found guilty at trial or they plead guilty in a court of law. Now, Mr. Matthew Hutchins is obviously suing Mr. Baldwin, uh, as well as others have done so as well for the, uh, he's doing this for his, the death of his uh, daughter. Now, like I said, that is either the most cold thing, most heartless thing, or that is just really good lawyering. I'm gonna, I'm not gonna lie to you here. I'm a little torn. It's pretty good lawyering because the lawyer is basically saying in the pleadings that Helena Hutchinson practically ordered that she be uh, shot by directing Baldwin to hold the gun up and to pull the hammer back and uh, apparently to release it as well. Um, that's what the lawyer's argument is. Now, I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but that's going to be their defense, saying she's contributory negligent. She basically should have checked that gun herself, and she told Mr. Baldwin what to do, and there's an assumption of risk there. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you may not like that, but that's what, insure, that's what, that's what lawyers do. And I can assure you that the lawyers making that argument are attorneys for the defendant, Mr. Baldwin, more than likely paid for by the insurance company. And that's what insurance company lawyers do. Blame it all on the people that are injured. I'm just saying. Some people are going to say, Scott, I love you, but my husband's a uh, insurance lawyer and he's they save uh, tens of millions of dollars in false claims. And I get that. That's good. But I have never, ever in all that money of false claims, as well as any sort of tort reform that's ever taken place, have I ever seen my insurance rates go down? Not a one. So I'm just saying. Cold and heartless, doing what lawyers do, or just really good lawyering? Let me know. All right, there is a serial killer running loose, ladies and gentlemen, and um, investigators believe that there is a serial killer responsible for the five shootings of homeless people. All right, we're not gonna use the term unsheltered, unhoused, they're homeless, okay? And five people have been shot in New York and in Washington, D.C. Two of the five shootings were fatal, according to the police. Now, the suspect is believed to have begun his little spree in Washington, D.C. on March 3rd and traveled north, arriving in New York City on Saturday when he allegedly shot two victims in Soho. 
Now, a suspect was captured in a grainy surveillance video that shows them wearing long, dark clothing and a hat. Now, the New York Mayor Eric Adams and Washington, D.C. Mayor Muriel Bowser, Muriel Bowser released a joint statement addressing the threat. The work to get this individual off our street before he hurts or murders another individual is urgent, they both said. The mayors are encouraging homeless people to be on alert for the suspect serial killer who is targeting victims who are engaging in urban camping. Okay, that's what they call it here in Denver, at least not officially. It's unhoused, but really it's urban camping. And then when they tell everybody to move, they go on urban hikes to the next urban camping location. All right, Sherry Papini. That's right. Um, everything's fun and games until you get caught. Just ask Jussie Smollett. As you may recall, Sherry Papini was charged last week for making up an entire story of being kidnapped while jogging near her home in California by two Hispanic women. She was released on a $120,000 bond and is facing charges of making false statements to a federal officer as well as mail fraud, and she could in theory get up to 20 years in prison. Now that's very unlikely, but guess what? She's probably going to prison. You know why? She lied. Do you know why? They're going to do that to make an example of her. Why? Because she allegedly stole all the money that was given to help her when she really wasn't a victim. So it's kind of like fraud in the inducement. And then all the man hours and the limited public resources that the police department has went on a wild goose chase. And guess what? That's why if Miss Papini is convicted and we'll give her the presumption of innocence, she's probably going to jail. Probably not for a very long time, but that's why she would go. And she should go. And if you haven't noticed, she's a white female. It's not like Jussie Smollett's brother is saying that it's all racism. Miss Papini should go to jail if she's convicted. Bottom line. Next, let's talk about the guy who got a little carried away in the Museum of Modern Art. Meet Gary Cabana. Now, he is supposedly 60 years old, and he is wanted by the New York Police Department investigators for allegedly stabbing two female 24-year-old Museum of Modern Art employees uh, last Saturday at about 4 p.m. There is a short surveillance video of Cabana climbing onto the museum's front desk with a knife in his hand and approaching the two workers. Now, a manhunt for Cabana is ongoing and took a bizarre turn when Mr. Cabana allegedly took to social media in a slew of posts to declare that he is being framed and to criticize the NYPD. Now, in response to one person's uh, comments in the section, he said, quote, every person picked up in New York City has at least 30 priors. It's a freaking revolving door of justice, end quote. In another, he joked, now Gramps can take his nap and by morning the cops will still be filling out paperwork, end quote. And in another, he stated, quote, he was in Honduras and said, this is a perfect example of how effed up our justice system is in the United States. Even if I turn myself in, in New York City, they have no bail provisions, and so I would walk in the front door and a couple hours later be back on the street. Be glad I am in Honduras. Lots of bad hombres here. I'm taking Machismo 101 class just to keep up. Cabana's address is listed as Times Square, a charity-run building at 255 West 43rd Street for formerly homeless people or people who are mentally ill. Now, NYPD were stationed outside the building Sunday night. Cabana, who has gray hair and wears thick rimmed reading glasses, is still at large and obviously wanted by the police. Cabana's ramblings on uh, Facebook state bipolar is a tough road to hoe, Dr. Jekyll to Mr. Hyde. Then you get framed and evicted from the MoMA, not just the movies, all the art too, by a bitter old woman who shushes you when you're laughing during a comedy. Now, based on his address and Facebook posts, which directly notes bipolar disorder, it is believed that Cabana is battling mental health issues. Cabana has an active presence on social media, touting himself as the New York culture connoisseur. His photos often show him frequenting Broadway theaters, New York City music venues, and local museums. 
And according to police, Mr. Cabana's membership to the museum was revoked on Friday for two unspecified incidents involving disorderly conduct. He is thought to have returned to the scene on Saturday to exact revenge. Museum visitors were instructed to quickly evacuate the scene. One group was struck, one group was stuck in the basement with some people screaming and crying before being called out by police to run out of the building. Both workers who were stabbed were taken out on stretchers, but it is believed that their injuries are non-life-threatening. Thank goodness. Police request anyone with information on the suspect's whereabouts should contact New York Police Department investigators. Next on the docket, the flavor of the month when it comes to crime. Things go up and down in the criminal world. You know, when it comes to drugs, there was cocaine, then there was meth, then there was Special K, then there was heroin, now it's fentanyl. It's on every street corner. It's the flavor of the month that everybody wants to talk about. But here's one you're gonna hear a lot more about. It's called gas crimes. Be on the lookout for this new crime. Thieves are now stealing gasoline right from the gas tanks. That's right, thieves are going underneath the floor of trucks and drilling holes into the tanks to steal the gasoline before it hits the ground. Now gas prices are as high as $7 a gallon in some parts of the country. And needless to say, gasoline crimes have, have gone up. Now there are some dangers with stealing uh, gas from a tank. There are way worse ways than the original way of simply siphoning gas from a car's tank. Now if you've ever done this, it's not good. You usually wind up getting a little bit of gas in your mouth. You know, when you were younger, you maybe borrowed a little bit of gas from somebody's car. It was a thing, all right? Gas prices were expensive. See, what goes around comes around. Anyway, now if people are actually drilling into the tank with a drill bit and a drill, guess what? The gas tank could actually explode and cause catastrophic damages to the bystanders as well as the thieves. Um, which could leave the bigger problems, assuming they survive because if somebody dies, you could be charged with reckless manslaughter, arson, murder. It just depends on how stupid you are. So guess what? Simple rule to live by, don't touch other people's things. Don't steal other people's things. It doesn't belong to you. Keep your hands to yourself. That's what your mother would say, okay? You're hearing it from me. If you didn't listen to your mother, listen to me. And finally, our dumb criminal of the day. And this person, this is what you refer to as felony stupid, okay? Now, some things are just dumb and they shouldn't be felonies, but some people deserve to have a felony because they're just dumb, and this is it. A Florida man called the police and asked them to come test his meth, that's right, his methamphetamine, after fearing he may have been sold bath salts instead. This all occurred on Friday evening around 7 p.m. when the police received a call from a gentleman by the name of Thomas Eugene Kaluki, saying he had recently purchased methamphetamine from a man he met at a bar. Kaluki told police that he was an experienced drug user and that he had his suspicions about the drugs he had just bought. So he invited the cops to come over and test the drugs. Unfortunately for our dumb criminal of the day, he provided the officers two small baggies of crystal-like substance that the police tested, and they were able to determine that it was in fact methamphetamine. The police then arrested Mr. Kaluki for him possessing the drugs along with two counts of drug paraphernalia. He was taken to custody and had to post a $7,000 bond. Now our dumb criminal was reportedly hoping that if the drugs were fake, that the police would then put the person, would then get the person in trouble for selling dangerous drugs, despite not even knowing the address or the name of the man who sold him the drugs. That's just dumb. He deserves to go to jail, seriously. You can't make that stuff up. And that's not the first time people have done that. Why would drug users wanna call the police and say, come test my drugs, I think I got sold some bunk. Um, go get the bad guy, dumb. I, I just can't even, seriously, how dumb could you possibly be? Well. He can almost join maybe the winner from last week, Kenneth Clark Carlisle, who walked fully naked up to his next door neighbor's driveway in Florida and then defecated on a glass table on the porch. Congratulations, Mr. Carlisle. You are a dumb criminal of the week. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for watching. I don't know, maybe it was a little sarcastic today, but I don't know just dumb stuff today and I just felt like I
couldn't hold back. Sometimes you just got to keep that sarcasm coming. All right. Thanks for watching. Please join us tomorrow. Please join us for our live tomorrow at 6 p.m. Mountain Time right here. Until next time, we'll see you next time on Crime Talk.